Uh, right, good morning everyone. hope the hangovers aren't too bad from last night. Um, my name's uh, Jonathan Brookfield. I'm going to be talking today a little bit about uh, TLS, so some fairly, uh, fairly defenses uh, against it. So, um, switched to uh, product security and I've done uh, been working in product security in uh, Citrix and BlackBerry now for the last uh, 12 years. Security, what I mean is looking at their release. Very similar mandate. So, um, code, uh, code analysis, uh, find and fix all the, uh, uh, all the various security vulnerabilities. Um, in terms of the future, currently interested in, uh, a lot of this is BlackBerry sent because that's where I've been for the past, uh, couple of years is sort of authentication protocols, secure boot, um, Security architecture and threat modeling, and of course TLS. I'm here to talk to you uh, today about. Um, on the program, the uh, the talk should have been myself and Campbell Murray. Unfortunately, Campbell can't make it today, so uh, you're stuck with me. In terms of some of the building. sort of the certificate validation process that all clients should uh, should follow when uh, connecting to a server. I'm going to have a look at some of the uh, tools for testing uh, testing TLS clients. So be that a, uh, an Android application or some other form of uh, embedded um, IoT type device that's making TLS connections. Um, then we're going to have a look at some uh, some white box testing. So you have Kodak from an embedded device or an APK. Uh, there are particular uh, four that will indicate uh, things like um, certificate validation is happening or isn't happening. So we're just going to have a look at uh, those APIs, and then. Fairly busy, uh, busy few years for TLS. Uh, there's been lots and lots of problems with it. And then on to uh, on to Q and A. So in terms of how TLS actually works, for those not familiar, the very first thing is a client will normally do a DNS uh, query for the name of the server that it wants to connect to. It'll get back the uh, the IP address of that uh, of said server. Then the client will make a TCP connection, and then in TLS, it will send a, uh, a client hello. Um, this packet contains things like the version, the cipher suites that the client is interested in, uh, and a whole bunch of other extensions that are, um, we, won't, we won't be covering in this talk. The server then responds with the version it, it wants to use, so it wants to use, and another extensions. Sends back some certificates. Uh, that's normally its server certificate, and any intermediate certificates. We'll talk a bit more about that later. And then, if you're using a PFS cipher cipher suite that support, supports perfect forward secrecy, you'll then get an additional package that contains things like Diffie-Hellman prime. Uh, at that point, the server says. I'm done, and the client uh, then has to perform the certificate ver uh, validation check of the server side, and then uh, it'll once it's done that and it's happy, it'll send the client key exchange message. Now this is the this is the message that actually contains the uh, key material from the client to the server that they will then switch to. So everything up till now has been in the clear. Once um, once this packet is uh, is sent, 
both sides have agreed a, uh, a symmetric key and then they'll switch to uh, using, uh, using that for uh, encryption and integrity for, for the protocol. And those are the two uh, next messages from the server, so the, uh, from the server and the client. So the, the change cipher spec is the, uh, the client's now moved to the that we agreed. So that's, that's pretty much what we're going to do uh, in a couple of minutes. Digging into current good one. about a year ago with uh, the Poodle attack, which uh, was an attack from, uh, from Oracle. Um, there's also a lot of changes happening um, in TLS 1.3. This is currently in development. So yeah, something to, uh, to keep, your, uh, keep your eyes on. <coughs> Briefly about the, uh, the If you're if you're ever looking at the uh, TLS handshake in Wireshark, there's two different versions that go across. There's one within the record the record layer, uh, actually ignored. It's the, uh, the important one. Um, one other behavior you'll see from some clients, and this is specifically browsers, um, they will start off with uh, a TLS 1.2 handshake and slowly uh, they will go down to say a TLS 1.1 handshake or a TLS 1.0 handshake. Um, this is, the, they're doing the, uh, the renegotiation to, uh, to work around um, different uh, different interoperability issues with servers. So from a, again, just perspective, if you're looking at client hellos and you see a failed connection, don't assume it's, uh, that that's the only connection. There may be retries, uh, there may be retries after that. In terms of what you're looking for in, uh, in Wireshark, um, this is a, uh, a connection for, uh, from Chrome on Windows to encrypted.google.com. And you can see the, uh, the TLS uh, the TLS handshake version number, and then the uh, the client uh, the version number in the client hello. So that's that in in this case that's the uh, the client saying I want to use TLS 1.2, and then in the server hello, uh, which you can see up there, you see the server responding with yep we'll uh, we'll work with um, uh, TLS 1 1.0. Now, um, Cypher Suites, um, if you've looked at TLS connections uh, in Wireshark, you'll see the client proposes a large number of Cypher Suites, and they're generally long, uh, um, they're textual representations, so it'll be TLS RSA with uh, AES uh, SHA-1. Um, the textual representation actually uh, tells you four different parts about the, uh, about the Cypher Suite. The first part is the, uh, the authentication algorithm. So this is, the, this is generally the algorithm that the client uses to authenticate the server. So um, this is R RSA or DSA or elliptic curve DSA. So the, this is the algorithm used in the, generally used in the server certificate. Um, the next part of the Cypher Suite is something called the, uh, the key exchange or uh, agreement algorithm. So this is, the, uh, this is the algorithm that's actually used by the client to set, uh, the client and the server to agree a key. RSA can do both. Uh, that's why it's in both. Uh, so 
you have uh, you can you can both authenticate the server using its RSA certificate and then encrypt the uh, key that's sent back to the server. So that's why uh, that's why this one is in uh, is in both. You then also got um, Diffie Hellman and uh, East Elliptic Curve Diffie Hellman. These um, if you've heard of perfect forward secrecy, um, these key agreement algorithms are the things that allow um, uh, allow you to lose, sorry, allow you to have the server key compromised but not be able to decrypt uh, previous traffic. In terms of, uh, sorry, then then having done the, the encryption and the key agreement, the, uh, the client and the server then switched to using uh, bulk encryption uh, algorithms. So, the, uh, sorry, yeah. So these are um, RC, RC4, DES, triple DES, AES. There's a few others that you'll see in there, things like Camilla and Seed um, as well. These are uh, algorithms from, uh, from, other country, uh, from other countries. And then you have the, uh, you finally have the MAC. Um, so the MAC is the HMAC that's, uh, that's performed over the whole of the encrypted, uh, the encrypted record to, uh, to provide integrity. Um, also, just mentioning briefly, uh, TLS also has something called a, a PRF, uh, that's a pseudo-random function. That's used in deriving the, uh, what's called the, uh, the, the master secret. Um, and it's just, an it's just an algorithm that everything, uh, various different parts are put through to, uh, to get the master secret that all other keys are then, uh, are then derived from. It's not mentioned in uh, in the handshake, but since uh, but there's been a change between one and one point two. You can find the full list um, at that URL. Um, there's about two hundred of them, um, which all have uh, interesting uh, interesting properties. Or have implementation. So the first one, TLS RSA, that's fairly stock. Um, that me that. Diffie Hellman or uh, ECC with Diffie uh, with elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. All of these are. Uh, your PFS, uh, if your if your server key is compromised through something like heart bleed, any previous traffic that's been captured can't be decrypted. In terms of bulk ciphers, it's all about AES. Uh, triple DES is still in there um, because I know a number of sites need it for compatibility with old, with older browsers, um, uh, but. Probably the best ones at the moment are AES GCM. Um, then, in terms of the Mac, it's again different uh, d uh, different strengths of um, SHA algorithms. Now, onto the uh, the more interesting or the uh, cipher suites. There is a cipher suite called the null cipher suite. It means no authentication, no encryption, and no integrity. Um, most of the time it's disabled, but you might see it once in a while. Um, you also have um, the uh, what are called the anonymous uh, cipher suites. Uh, now, they, these cipher suites, so anonymous Diffie-Hellman and anonymous uh, EC Diffie-Hellman, uh, they perform no server authentication. So if you ever see a client offering um, those cipher suites or a server accepting those cipher suites, that means you will be able to uh, perform an active man in the middle attack on that connection, and neither side will notice. You also have uh, RSA export. So this uh, this is for much smaller RSA keys, so 512-bit RSA keys. Uh, it's a product of U.S. government export regulations from uh, about 20 years ago, and you, if you've been following any of the recent TLS. Uh, vulnerabilities, uh, freak and logjam were uh, RSA export ha was implicated in uh, in some in some of those. Um, 
The reason that one's up there is because a 512-bit uh, service certificate, I think, can be factored on AWS for about $70. So again, if you get the uh, if you get the service public key, you spend $70. You get the service private key, you can then impersonate that server. Um, in terms of some of the bulk ciphers, uh, you get um, you get the null cipher, uh, the null bulk cipher. So in this instance, server authentication has happened, um, but no confidentiality will be present on the traffic. So as a as a passive observer, you'll be able to see all of the uh, all of the traffic in the clear. The uh, the rest of the um, the rest of the uh, bulk ciphers are all, with the exception of 128-bit uh, RC4, are all 40-bit or 56-bit. These are sufficiently small these days that they can be brute forced. Um, I believe DES on the right hardware can be brute forced in about a day. Now, again, from, a, from an attacker's perspective, what that means is if you capture a single connection uh, with the right hardware in a day, you could decrypt that entire, uh, that entire connection if, they, uh, uh, if you have the appropriate resources. Or the reason that the 128-bit encryption is up there is because there's a, there's a lot of bias in the, uh, in the key stream. And there was some analysis at Royal Holloway uh, that they can, if they capture something like in the region of 2 to the 32 um, uh, uh, replays of the same plain text, they can uh, decrypt. Uh, they can decrypt that. That's quite a lot, um, but it was felt. Uh, yeah, it was felt that it was time to uh, retire RC4. And finally, on the Mac side, there is only one cipher that uh, doesn't do integrity protection, and that's the uh, the null cipher, which I already talked about in the context of uh, authentication and key exchange. So, in terms of putting all of that together. Um, these are the really bad cipher suites you'll see on the left. Um, what, you ha what you get crosses in both the uh, in the anonymous Diffie-Hellman and the anonymous elliptic curve cipher suite. It's because it depends on the type of attacker you are. If you're a passive attacker, you get uh, you can get you'll get confidentiality. If you're a, um, an active attacker, you don't. So again, that is just whether you're listening uh, with Wireshark, whether you're actively intercepting uh, both. Um, uh, yeah, actively intercepting. So in terms of how they're picked, uh, the client says, hi, I'd like to use these uh, one of these cipher suites. The server picks the cipher suite. And then the client goes, yep, I'll use that or not. And then closes the, uh, and if it says not, then it closes the, uh, the connection. Likewise with, um, with browsers, you'll sometimes see them make multiple handshakes with different sets of cipher suites. This was actually done by IE to uh, disable RC4. So the first handshake would go out without RC4. Um, but for interoperability reasons, if they, if it needed it, it would then do it would, uh, it would then do a second handshake if the first one failed, uh, and um, to to interoperate with servers. So in terms of C in uh, in Wireshark, there's a bunch of deciphers. Uh, a couple that are unknown up there are new ones uh, that have been added to Chrome. Again, this is a connection from Chrome to encrypted.google.com. Uh, uh, and Wireshark just haven't been updated to, uh, to know what they are yet. Then the server will respond with the, uh, the appropriate cipher suite that it wants to use. So I've talked a bit about The, there's a lot in the server certificate, but these are some of the uh, some of the major items that are used when by the client to uh, to determine if it should trust the uh, trust the server certificate. So the first thing it has is its public key. This is either an RSA key or an elliptic curve key. 
It then has the validity, so the date that server, the certificate is valid from and valid to. Then it has a subject. This is, uh, this is where the uh, server identity is placed into the certificate, so the, uh, the FQDN of the server. So going back to my example of google.com, that, uh, that will be in the, the common name, uh, and I'll show you that in a moment. You can actually have certificates that are valid for multiple hosts, and the, the way that this is handled is something called the subject alternate name. And in so you can have you can have one in the uh, in many more in the uh, in the subject alternate name. Again, uh, we'll have a look at that in a minute. You then have the issuer. Uh, this is just a, a text field, um, but it has to map it that should match the subject of the certificate that signed it. So when you have a server certificate, it's normally signed by an intermediate CA. That intermediate CA will have a name, a subject, like um, uh, Jonathan's, Jonathan's CA, and that will have to match the issuer. You then have the signature. So this is the part where uh, this is the um, the part where the intermediate CA's private key has signed the certificate. And it's the, it's the text that allows the client to re recreate that signature and validate that it's, uh, it was actually signed by the intermediate CA. So there is a lot on this slide. Uh, this is some of what a client has to do when validating uh, a The, the, the client does is it will often it will it will in the client hello it'll send the name of the server that it wants to connect to. Uh, you'll see this in in the SNI uh, packet or the server name indicator packet. That tells the server which certificate to return. Um, this this is used if there's multiple different uh, uh, different websites hosted on a, a single IP. Having turns its certificate and any intermediate certificates that it thinks the client needs in order to be able to build a, uh, build a certificate chain. Now what I mean by a certificate chain is um, all, cli all clients normally have a set of root certificates provisioned in them. And the certificate chain, uh, the root certificate and an intermediate or maybe more intermediate certificates uh, to the server certificate in such a way that the find each other. So having got the certificate and the intermediate certificates back, the client then attempts to build these chains. Sometimes there's one, uh, sometimes there can be more. If uh, Once it's built this certificate, starting for, um, assuming the chain runs from the root certificate to the intermediate uh, to the server certificate, it then starts with the intermediate certificate and it goes, is, is the signature valid? And by that, it looks at the root certificate and goes, did that root certificate sign, uh, sign the intermediate certificate? Then checks the validity, checks whether it hasn't been revoked it's using CRLs or OCSP. This isn't actually used much by browsers, but I mention it briefly in passing. It then checks that the, even though the uh, signature may be valid. It also checks that the uh, the issuer name is valid. So by that, the subject from the root CA matches the intermediate CA. Um, in certificates, you have uh, you have a number of extensions, uh, and one of them is one called uh, the basic constraints extension. Now, there's a flag in a basic constraints extension that says whether something is or isn't a certificate authority. Uh, so if this extension is present. And there's a root uh, sorry, there's an intermediate certificate and another intermediate certificate. Each one of those has to have, have the flag that says I'm a CA. Um, if it doesn't, uh, then it can't be used in uh, in a chain. You then also have um, a chain length. So some certificate authorities specify, I don't know, say only want three certificates to be in each chain. This is checked. Um, there's also a bunch of things around key usage, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over for now. 
So this is done for every every certificate in the uh, in the chain. So we start off at the intermediate, then to the next intermediate if that happens, then finally to the server certificate. And if all of those checks pass, then we go, yep, that's a good server certificate. Then the client has to check the uh, the actual identity in the certificate belongs to the server that it thinks it should. If you don't do this, then uh, I could get a certificate for, say, Jonathan.com, and I could give it to your, uh, you could connect uh, to my server, I could give it to you, and you go, oh, well, that's, that's fine, that's, sign, that's a signed certificate, even though you were thinking that you might be connecting to, uh, to Google, uh, Google.com. Now, in terms of some of the things that can go, um, just listing them uh, one at a time, not doing it. Uh, there are a number of uh, a number of different uh, mobile phone applications have not have been caught not checking TLS, um, not validating the uh, the common name or the subject alternate name. That's the attack I just described. Um, writing it yourself. Uh, I mentioned the the RFC that describes this has 24 pages just dedicated to validating certificates. Um, it's pretty complicated, and I have previously seen some attempts to uh, to write it uh, to write it afresh, and invariably they they make the same mistakes that have previously been uh, been made. Talked about um, accepting small server certificates in the uh, in the certificate size, specifically that they can be uh, they can be easily factored. When uh, when you sign a certificate, you sign it using uh, a hash algorithm, so MD5, SHA1, SHA256. Uh, MD5 was broken um, back, I think, in 2008. Uh, and was actually used in the flame malware attack to uh, to install uh, malware on different uh, sorry to install signed malware on different hosts. So by the end of 2016, SHA one will have been deprecated as well by most of the modern browsers. Um, uh, I get, uh, same same again as accepting expired uh, expired certificates or accepting certificates without revocation information. Um, I, again, I put that one in there. Uh, currently, most browsers don't do certificate checking using either CRLs or OCSP, but there is some labeling uh, which is becoming more common. In terms of what we'll see, is the certificate dialog from uh, uh, from Windows, and it just shows you the the common name, uh, the issuer, and uh, and its dates. If you uh, if you want more details on the uh, on the details tab, you get a whole. Bunch of the signature algorithm, the issuer, um, uh, date, uh, you know, its validity. And as well, the common name. So specifically, r.google.com. That means that certificate is valid. Server um, uh, uh, wildcarded.google.com. Now, this particular certificate from encrypted.google.com is actually valid for a whole bunch more. So in the subject. CA, uh, uh, this particular certificate valid for lots and lots of different uh, different server identities. Um, sometimes you can't see those in uh, if you're looking at a mobile phone application or uh, an IoT device. You won't be able to see certificates that the server sent. You can get all of the same information in, uh, in Wireshark. So here you can see uh, and then the second two uh, 
uh, that Google sends. Again, just drilling down a little bit more, you can see the uh, the expiry, uh, sorry, the uh, the validity, the subject name, and the issuer. All, all the information is in uh, in Wireshark, and likewise, uh, likewise the uh, the common the common names. So. Uh, TLS. I mentioned uh, a few times about attacking a mobile phone application or an IoT uh, device that's performing uh, TLS connections. There are there are a number of applications uh, or tools out there that do uh, that do this. Um, I'm gonna... These are the ones that I'm, I'm more familiar with and uh, and have used. Um, so SSL Smith. This was originally written in 2002 by uh, Moxie uh, Marlin Spoke, and uh, so this this will perform active man in the middle attacks. So you set it up on a Linux box with traffic flowing through it, and it will automatically generate uh, server certificates using a uh, using a fake CA. So you can use this to intercept, do targeted attacks on particular hosts or generically all hosts. Excuse me. Unfortunately, one of the, unfortunately, um, it's not been updated since 2011, and does have a couple of bugs that I've run into. Um, so since then, I've been using uh, SSL Split. Very, very similar idea. Um, it'll it'll intercept TLS connections going through uh, going through a Linux box, or uh, there's there's various other ways to set up as well. And again, will uh, will produce Server certificates using a uh, using a custom CA. Um, it's also worth pointing out this one has uh, support for late start TLS connections. So some uh, some uh, some connections like POP3 and IMAP will start off plain text and then you'll see them switch to start TLS. Um, this uh, this particular application will detect that, so you can uh, you can perform active attacks on those connections as well. Um, no go to fail is a, a relatively new uh, tool that's been re released by uh, a guy from uh, from Google. Um, very similar game in that it does active man in the middle attacks, but this time it does probabilistic ones. So rather than intercepting all connections, you tell it how many types of connections you want it to intercept. So you can say, I want it to intercept 10% of connections or 20% of connections. And because of that, it can try different attacks on different connections. So um, it'll do exactly the same as uh, SSL sniff and SSL split in that it will generate, uh, generate um, certificates for the servers on the fly, but it will also do other attacks like a valid certificate with an invalid host name or um, uh, mess with the anonymous cipher suites that we talked about earlier. So there's about, there's about eight attacks that it will do. Um, and again, because it's doing it probabilistically, it will just try one and if it doesn't pass it, it won't, the, the client will just reconnect and it will go, it'll go straight through. The nice thing about this one in terms of modification is it's written in Python. So if you want to add a new if you want to add new attacks to it, it's a little barrier to entry compared to the C uh, the C code on SSL sniff and SSL split is a little bit lower. Um, you also then have man in the middle proxy and man in the middle dump. Uh, exactly the same. Um, auto generated auto generated certificates from a custom CA. Um, uh, they also have regex, so you can ignore certain domains. Now, in terms of how uh, how I actually how I've set this up for myself, um, I've got a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it was Raspberry Pi one, three. Um, I set it up with uh, with IP forwarding enabled and uh, a Wi-Fi access point, so. I can connect a, a mobile device to it or an IoT device um, over over Wi-Fi to uh, to it. In terms of how 
how the actual connections uh, are intercepted, uh, most of them are in the way that I set up SSL split and SSL sniff is by using IP tables to redirect uh, redirect traffic to them. So what, what will happen is a packet from uh, the mobile device or the mobile application will come into um, into the Linux kernel and the Linux kernel will go, okay, is that one for one of my targeted hosts? If not, just forward it on. If it is, it'll redirect it to the SSL uh, split process. And the SSL split process will at that point fork uh, the connection. So it'll make one connection out to the, the target server and hold the connection open to the, uh, to the client. It'll get the, uh, the certificate from the, uh, from the server it's connected to, make a fake one, and so there'll be one handshake, one TLS handshake that happens between the client and SSL split, and then one that happens between SSL split and the server. And then it'll lo it will log all of the, uh, all of the traffic. So if you want to set something like uh, something like this up, the I'm making the assumption that you have a working uh, a working Linux box doing routing. Once you get that up and running, you can create a, you can create a fake CA. Um, there's a Perl script from OpenSSL called CA.pl, uh, and that will do all uh, all of that for you. You then want to redirect the uh, the traffic. From uh, from the client to a particular target server to SSL, that's that IP tables line there, and then you start SSL split. Um, the bottom line is a bit messy, but that basically allows you to run uh, Wireshark, uh, sorry, run TCP dump on the Raspberry Pi and pipe the output to Wireshark, so you can see all of the traffic that's happening on the uh, the Raspberry Pi. In terms of uh, no, no go to fail again, I'm assuming that you've got a, uh, a Raspberry Pi with IP forwarding enabled. You'll need to request a, if you want to use the um, invalid hostname attack, you need a valid certificate. Uh, so you need to go and request a certificate for a domain that you own. Um, so again, on the example, jonathan.com, I don't own it, but if I did, I could go and request a, a certificate for that. You then need to put that in the no go to fail directory, create a, a config file, um, just walking through the, uh, the different attacks. So drop TLS, that will force uh, connections down to SSL v3. Self-signed will try a, a certificate that's been generated from the, the custom CA that's not trusted by the client. The anon server, that's the anonymous Diffie Hellman attacks that we talked about earlier. Um, Superfish man in the middle. Um, this uh, fish was uh, something that was found to be installed on Lenovo laptops about a year ago. Um, it was uh, the same CA was used on all Lenovo laptops. So if you got said CA, uh, you could intercept. Uh, you could intercept any traffic. Now I, I put it up there not because I want to specifically intercept. Lenovo laptops, but because you can overload that functionality. Um, if you ever want to test whether there's certificate pinning happening, um, uh, sorry, CA pinning, this is specifically, does your uh, application, if, th if there's a trust store, uh, sorry, a certificate store that you can add your own certificate into, uh, you, can add, you can add a custom certificate into that. You can then find out if applications are trusting that user store. So you can actually overload this functionality here to test for CA pinning in, mo in mobile applications. Sorry if that ex explanation wasn't uh, the best. Um, and then, yeah, to start it is just Python. So those are the tools that I've used. Um, the next, uh, the next sort of ten minutes are basically the. So OpenSSL, um, really quickly. So this I tested on OpenSSL 1.02G on Ubuntu 16.04. Ubuntu. Um, 
OpenSSL changes, so uh, you'll need to test it on whatever you're using. But on the protocol side of things, generally pretty good. It uses TLS 1.2 by default, and, and SSL v3 is disabled. Cypher suites, pretty good, with the exception of RC4 128-bit being enabled. Now, certificate validation and host, and host name validation are all di disabled by default in OpenSSL. Now, what, what I mean by that is, if you're, using the open, if you're using the OpenSSL APIs in C, you have to do it yourself. Um, so, in terms of the, if you are looking at code, um, API calls to uh, SSL CTX U and uh, SSL CTX setups for uh, setting the protocol versions. Likewise for Cypher Suites. I'm going to call out the, the, the two APIs for um, host name verification and certificate name verification. If you don't see these when you're looking at OpenSSL code in a client, that almost certainly means it's not doing um, any form of certificate validation or host name validation. So you as an active attacker can um, can perform uh, man-in-the-middle attacks on it. Options that, are, that can be set to configure uh, interoperability with servers. When you set those, it disables the mitigation for, uh, for the beast attack. So you actually have to set that explicitly. So again, if you see this, um, it means your client's potentially vulnerable to uh, to beast. Um, so when, you're, when you're actually building sets of cipher suites uh, in OpenSSL, you can you build them using a series of words. Some of these words can represent uh, either an individual cipher suite or a collection of uh, of cipher suites. The uh, there are particular words that if you see are concerning. Uh, so a null that means all the anonymous cipher suites that we talked about earlier. E null um, that's all of the uh, all of the null cipher the, the null encryption cipher suites that we saw uh, we saw earlier. There's another problem with the words uh, that mm, that are collections of cipher suites in that they change. Uh, OpenSSL on one platform high will mean one thing, uh, but if it's been compiled if a newer version of OpenSSL comes out, high may have changed its meaning. Uh, likewise, if it's been compiled in a particular way, high will have again changed its meaning. So while you have these standard words, their meanings across systems can change. So you need uh, you need to test them. Uh, and the way the way that you 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 find out the full set of cipher suites uh, is by uh, by running OpenSSL ciphers on the list. Now that obviously has to be the OpenSSL library that you're linking against. In terms of libcurl, um, libcurl is a, a better than open uh, Protocol versions are good, cipher suites generally pretty good, and certificate validation and hostname uh, validation are enabled by default. Um, on the hostname validation, if you want to do calls to uh, curl easy setup, with uh, SSL verify peer or SSL verify host set to zero, that's the client disabling um, certificate verification and hostname verification. Uh, and for the record, that was L747. So Java, um, again, pretty good. Um, uh, pretty good on the, pro uh, the protocol versions, pretty good on the cipher suites. Validation is enabled. Um, when it came to hostname valid validation, it's enabled depending on the API that you use. So if you use the uh, HTTPS URL connection class, uh, that's fine. But if you're using just a, van a vanilla um, SSL socket from the SSL socket factory, hostname validation is not done. Again, this means with a valid certificate, you can uh, uh, you can perform a, a, an active attack. So, 
I'm not, Java, Java, when it comes to enabling and disabling uh, certificate validation, is a lot more complicated than uh, than curl and uh, and OpenSSL. Uh, what you're looking for is any class that implements X509 Trust Manager. Specifically, the method that you're looking for is check server trusted. If that doesn't throw an exception, then the certificate is considered trusted. So again, just something to uh, uh, keep an eye out for. On the, host, on the hostname validation side, you can also add what are called uh, hostname verifiers. Uh, these are only called if the hostname doesn't, uh, doesn't pass. Again, when using the HTTPS URL connection. But if you ever see that return true, just as, uh, as simply as that, it means someone is uh, the code is ignoring um, uh, ignoring um, uh, or not doing hostname validation. Python, um, pretty good. Uh, no, uh, most things are now enabled by default, um, and protocol versions and cipher suites are good. Again, if you certain none or check host name equals false, that means someone's switching it off. A um, couple of other notes with Python. It has the same issues as OpenSSL on Cypher Suites. They're built using words. Uh, that, that whose meanings can change. So you need to keep an eye on what they on what those are. Uh, if you just use a, if you just create your own SSL context, then uh, certificate verification and hostname validation are off by default. You need to call the create default context to uh, to have them enabled by default. The other thing with Python is the. Certificate validation and hostname validation are being enabled by default. It's only a relatively recent change to Python. Anything pre 7.9 or 343, I think, uh, doesn't do uh, doesn't do any of this by default. Um, so if you have older Linux distros, then uh, even the updates may even updated versions, you know, fully patched may not do this. So again, something to keep an eye on. Um, I'm going to skip over requests, um, and that's a set of some of the TLS issues that have happened over the past uh, past few years. That list isn't complete. Um, lots of them in this talk sort of covered the basics. So that's it from me. Thank you. And any questions?